Welcome, everybody. Good evening. Uh, this is the election forum for the League of Women Voters and the American Association of University Women. My name is Rick Shaneyfeldt. I'm a 40-year resident of the Olympic Peninsula, and I've been asked to moderate tonight. And like many of us, we're, we volunteer in this community, so I'm also going to point out some other volunteers that are here. We have a sound and video crew in the back. Gary Enbrecht, in the dark, sweatshirt. <laughs> Sonny Flores, running the, the keyboard back there. Dennis Deneau on video. And I don't see Jackie yet, but Jackie's, oh, there's Jackie, our timer. She doesn't have her hat on, it threw me off. All right. So, we're going to hear from uh, two key people before we hear from the candidates, and that's Sheila Murphy on behalf of the League of Women's Voters. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I am the uh, president, of the, it's a unit chair of the uh, local league. We're a very small league and we're always looking for new members. And write this down, our next meeting is July 26th at 7 o'clock at the basement of the Bishop Hotel. And if you really feel despair today, you should come to our meeting because that's a place to start making some changes. We do things like forums. We're a small group, but it's effective because we're all about education in the league. Our next forum is July 9th here, and it's with the sheriffs and the prosecutors. And our Final uh, forum before the uh, primary election is July 18th at the Beach Club in Port Ludlow, and it's with, who is it with now? <laughs> the county commissioners, right. That was a brain fart, sorry. <laughs> anyway, and the thing about that July 18th uh, forum, it's at 6 o'clock at the Beach Club, not 7, so... You know, just an FYI. Thank you all for coming, and I really appreciate the help with Rick stepping up to do this moderating because it's, he's new, and so we're all going to be kind and respectful to Rick tonight because we want him to do it again. <laughs> and thank you to AAUW. Without the AAUW, we couldn't do this. Thank you. And next, on behalf of uh, AAUW, we have Catherine Buchanan. Thank you all for coming. I want to echo, echo uh, the league on that one. Um, we have uh, the largest AAUW group in the state of Washington, uh, two, over 200 members. We sponsor, um, our mission is for Advocacy, Education, and Philanthropy, and Research for Women, and Equity. We have uh, projects for Career Days, the Chimicum Literacy Project in the primary schools, Grant Street Literacy Project, Math Projects in the Chimicum and Grant Street schools. Um, and we have given out this year, our 70th anniversary, over seven. $70,000 in scholarships for women and girls in East Jefferson County. So, thank you very much. So, uh, as you probably, many of you already know, our candidates today are Steve Theringer, Democrat incumbent, position 2, 24th District, and Jim, Jim McIntyre, Republican challenger for position two. Now we've got the, the applause out of our system. Oh, he's going to fix my mic so I don't have to squat down. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have some ground rules for the audience uh, since we're all here to learn. This is an opportunity to, to hear from key people in our community and who may lead us in, in Olympia. Uh, so I think we should just end the applause at this point and no cheering, no jeering. Let's just listen respectfully to what these people have to say 
And uh, we'll use the microphone in the back there when you present a question because, uh, and Gary's pointing to that microphone, uh, we need to do that because we are being recorded, both video and radio, and uh, it needs to be done in a way that can be repeated. Uh, we will have a five-minute intermission, and that will be after our first two candidates are done. Then you can go have cookies, and then we'll come back and start with the second uh, two candidates. And actually, that'll be your, your only remaining applause line will be for the cookies and all the people who made them. So as far as the candidates go, I've been over this with them, but just so you know, both candidates get three minute opening statements. Both candidates get two minutes to respond to audience questions. And then both candidates get three minutes for closing statements. We have a timer and the timer will show a yellow card when there's one minute left and a red card when the time is up. And I'll ask Mr. Theringer to pick a hand. You go first. <laughs> so Mr. Theringer will make the first opening statement. Well, thank you, Rick. Thank the League and thank the Association of University Women. And uh, it's great always to see turnout, such a great turnout on a, on a Wednesday night for folks that are interested in our politics and our government and our election elective process. So it's great to see you here. I am Steve Theringer. I'm a 40-year resident of the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, I've been honored to be your, your representative for the last eight years. Before that, I was a county commissioner in Clown County for three terms for 12 years. And before that, or during that period, I was a small business owner. I had a wood manufacturing business. Uh, actually, man uh, we called it Dungeness Woodworks, making uh, distinctive woodenware for the gourmet kitchen. And we were selling that all over the country. So I have small business experience. I have land use experience because I was chair of the planning commission in Clown County and of course county commissioner experience for 12 years in Clown County, working actually alongside uh, Representative Mike Chapman. Um, in the legislature, I am chair of the Capital Budget Committee, which is a, one of the three fiscal committees in the House. The other one is the Appropriations Committee, which I sit on, and then there's the Transportation Budget. I also am on the Healthcare Committee. So these three committees give me an ability to do a lot of good for the Olympic Peninsula. For example, the crosswalk between healthcare and appropriations and the capital budget has made it possible for me to see the need in dental clinics. We were able to fund a dental clinic here in Jefferson Health in Jefferson County at the hospital and one in Port Angeles for the Vimo Clinic. And also working on the Appropriations Committee, as folks may know, there's a real shortage and it's very challenging to get nurses and medical technicians in rural Washington. So we worked with uh, both Olympic Medical Center and Jefferson Healthcare and Peninsula Community College to set up a training program for nurses and medical technicians so that they'll train with the college and then get internships and, and positions if they choose at OMC and Jefferson Health. So I think that's a, that's a, a good partnership between the state the college and the hospitals. Actually, some private citizens have, all already, have also stepped up to provide scholarships. So I think experience matters. I think building relationships in the legislature, when I write the capital budget, it's a very much a bipartisan effort. I work with my ranking member from the get-go, establishing that budget, and it takes you a while to build the relationships to be effective to help meet the needs here on the Olympic Peninsula. So I'm, Honored to be here tonight and honored to be your representative. I can't see all of you, so I'm going to stand up, I think, so I can see better. Um, thank you very much, League and AAUW, for uh, putting this forum together and uh, presenting uh, both of us the desire to serve you uh, in Olympia. Uh, I'm Jim McIntyre, and before I forget to say it, I would love to have your vote in the August primary election and also in November in the general election. I'm a 28-year uh, um, veteran of the U.S. Coast Guard. I retired as a captain, commanded three ships along the way. 
spent another six years in Washington, D.C. as a senior civil servant, retired from the federal government uh, when I'd had enough of Washington, D.C. I was there 20 years on and off uh, between assignments in the Coast Guard and then uh, finally as a civilian. Uh, Sherry and I wanted to get away as far as we could from D.C., and we almost made it to Forks and wound up in Squim in 2006. Um, I was uh, found uh, for the first time in my life with nothing to do, and a friend of mine said, why don't you think about running for public office? And I said, well, that's never been on any, any to-do list or bucket list of mine, but uh, I looked into it, ran for a seat on the Port of Port Angeles Commission and served a term as a port commissioner and then uh, succeeded uh, my opponent Steve on the board of commissioners uh, for Clallam County for a term there. The last year uh, I was a county commissioner, I was elected by the other uh, 20 some odd timber counties to represent their interests on the board of natural resources. It's a statewide body that sets policy for uh, use of public lands, uh, timber lands in particular. Why am I running? Two things, very simple. Uh, I think, well, I don't think, I know rural Washington is different than urban Washington. We need a representative in Olympia. We need representatives, plural, in Olympia that understand the difference and understand what, what policy needs to be undertaken and made for rural Washington as opposed to urban Washington. The second reason is we need to do a lot better job, not only with policy, but with um, uh, other things that have to do with economic improvement, economic growth. Overall, in the 24th district, the economy um, has shrunk on an inflation-adjusted basis by a little over 6% since 2010. Uh, there's 46% of the school children in Jefferson County that come from families that are severely economically distressed. They are qualified for free and reduced meals at school. You gotta be pretty, pretty hurting economically to, to qualify for that. Much more later, thank you. Look forward to your questions. All right, we're, we are now open for questions. And if you have one, please step to the microphone. Excuse me while I get out my notes here. My name is Mike Cornforth. I'm a resident here at Port Townsend. I'm also a retired Naval officer. Uh, and here's a question for both candidates. Will you support legislation that requires universal background checks and ban semi-automatic weapons in high capacity magazines? Mr. McIntyre, would you sure. go first, please? I'll be happy to. Uh, we already have uh, through an initiative a couple of years ago, a, uh, a process that requires background checks for the purchase of any firearm under any circumstance between any two people. So that, that's already been done in our state. Uh, as far as uh, the second part of it was semi-automatic weapons, I believe, is that? Semi-automatic weapons and high-capacity magazines. And high-capacity magazines. No, I don't. Um, those are sporting weapons. And uh, I think they have a place in society, both for um, hunting. Um, Semi-automatic weapons are not any more dangerous or any less dangerous than any other firearm. firearm. It's the user that uh, really depends upon firearm safety, not the, not the firearm itself. So I wouldn't support that, I don't think. Uh, in the legislature this year, we banned bump stocks because of their semiotic semi-automatic nature. Actually, they're automatic. Uh, well, they turn a regular, a regular, a, a regular uh, rifle into a semi-automatic rifle. So uh, my interest is, um, I think there is, there is can, a- Can I interrupt sure, for a minute? Sure, sure. The bump stocks essentially allow the operator of the weapon to pull the trigger and the weapon will fire until the magazine is empty. That's an automatic weapon. Right, so in semiotic, you have to pull the trigger every time. Correct. All right, so I think we have an agreement on what's being asked, and I, I okay. think we all understand what a bump stock is. That was the weapon that was used okay. in Las Vegas. So we'll let 
uh, Mr. So Senator anyway, Jackson. we passed legislation to ban those. And uh, I, we are looking at, um, I think there is an initiative to look at, um, you know, removing multiple shell magazines, which I support. I do not agree with my opponent that it is a hunting. It seems to me hunting is hunting and skill, not multiple shells in a magazine. It seems to me that there's no real need. I also um, think that if you wanted to use them for sport, you should make them available at the ranges where you will be wanting to use that. But I don't see a need for them in our neighborhoods or in our homes. Um, so I think that answers your question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matthew Rainwater. I'm out of uh, Port Angeles. Uh, it's well worth being the drive coming here. My question is for both of you, obviously. Um, are you for a carbon tax? If so, please explain to me how taking more of my hard-earned money will help prevent global warming. And also explain to me why in this last proposal, so many major corporations were exempted from the carbon tax. So the... I don't think any of, I hope all of us in this room can agree that we have a challenge with a warming planet. And you could debate maybe whether it's anthropomorphic or whether it's some sunspots or something like that, but there is no question that the planet is warming, sea level is rising, and there are impacts on you know, our economy and our health. So we need policies to address that. A carbon tax is one approach. Um, you know, it does impact rural areas because in the end it does, become a, it does become a gas tax. I think if you look at other forms of fuel for vehicles, such as electric vehicles or recycled natural gas from landfills or uh, actually from dairies, we need, to make, we need to make changes so that we can use other forms of, of fuel for our, for our vehicles. But we need to address the challenge of climate change. And um, I don't think the initiative process is the best way, but one thing for the peninsula, we would actually be a net gain because we would get credit for carbon sequestration in our forests. And one of the things I've been working on is cross-laminated timber where you can use mass timber and put it into a building and for every cubic yard of that material, you will sequester a ton of carbon. So there's actually policies that would benefit the Olympic Peninsula if we look at a, uh, a very um, sophisticated uh, approach to uh, limiting carbon. No, I, I really don't support a carbon tax. Um, Rural folks, as we all know, have to drive uh, a little bit greater distances to get places. Uh, and it really, given the state of our economy that I was, uh, that I was giving you a little glimpse of earlier, uh, we, re we really simply can't afford to pay more for uh, goods and services. Every, every single pound just about of the goods that we buy in our stores here are brought by truck. Those, those goods are gonna be more expensive with a carbon tax. It's gonna be more expensive for us to put fuel in our, in our cars with a carbon tax. Um, I, I think the pain is much greater than the gain, to be quite honest with you. Um, and I agree with my opponent that uh, good forest management, forest health, is a way to um, deal with carbon. Younger trees, trees that are growing quicker, are much uh, better able to take carbon up and store it in their, in their trunks. Uh, when that's harvested and used as building material, that carbon stays in the, in the building that it uh, forms the structure of, or the siding for, or the roof of. So there are a lot of, a lot of things, and very quickly, uh, I've read a lot of the science, not lately, because I haven't had a whole lot of time lately, but the, the range of possibilities of either sea level rise or temperature rise or whatever is, is very difficult to make clear good policy on the basis of. There's just too wide of a range of possibilities for what we, uh, what we think may happen. The models that predict 
uh, climate change are too imprecise for us to make really intelligent, smart, good policy and spending decisions. So uh, a lot more to be said on that. Um, I'm representing the healthcare group of PT Indivisible tonight, and my question is a little technical, so if you will excuse me, it's short though, um, I will read part of it. The absence of sexual assault nurse examiner, which is called SANE, S-A-N-E, services in Jefferson County constitutes healthcare and law enforcement crises. Victims of sexual assault do not receive necessary comprehensive healthcare services without fully certified SANE providers, and law enforcement is hampered by lack of appropriate evidence collection and court testimony by fully certified SANE providers. What role do you see for the office you're seeking in bringing these services to our community, and what is your personal commitment to making this happen? And if that wasn't clear, what I mean is that rape victims are on their own. If there's going to be a rape kit and evidence taken, they have to drive themselves to Kitsap because we have no facility here. And if there is a rapist, uh, a known rapist who has been arrested, uh, he frequently will go free because there is no evidence against him. So I'd like to know, I know uh, Representative Thuringer, you're on the health committee, so you probably already know some of this, but I'd like to know if there's anything you can do to help us, since you're already working on expanding our medical core here. Thank you. Mr. Ackett, yeah, you're up first. Me? Okay. Um, it sounds to me from, from your question, the way, I, the way I interpret it is, it's sort of a cross, this, this individual is sort of a cross between a law enforcement uh, person or, a, or an asset to the uh, local police or the local sheriff's department and a hospital or a medical care facility of some kind. So with that understanding, um, I think there's a way to, to look at some funding for that uh, in terms of the, the state assistance to local law enforcement agencies. And I would, I would hazard a guess that this person might just be an on-call kind of a person, not a permanent employee. So it seems like to me that that would be something worthy of consideration by the legislature as an assist, as, as a, a state um, assist to local law enforcement uh, when, the, when the cases arise of, uh, of rape. So it seems like to me that would be something that we should that we should take a hard look at and try to provide some additional help to, to local law enforcement. So partly the way I view the job of being your representative is to work with issues like this with the, in this case, it would be the Department, DSHS, Department of Social and Health Services, or the HCA, the Healthcare Authority. And we're doing that actually right now. Sherry Van uh, Romer has talked to me about this issue, and we do have a gap here in Jefferson County. So we're following up on that, and, and right now are in the process of seeing, uh, particularly the kits themselves that are used to do the exam. There's a shortage of those here in Jefferson County and the, the staffing, the skills to be able to do that. So uh, we're on this topic, and um, I think all of us in this room would want to make sure that our loved ones have an opportunity, if they have this serious event happen in their lives, that we have the right medical uh, facilities and kits and expertise to be able to make sure the perpetrator is, the evidence is there to catch the perpetrator. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, my name is Brian Garrett. I'm a resident and, oh, thank you. S small business owner in Squim. A question for both of you. Are you in favor of the uh, initiative 1600? In fact, I was asked to sign one tonight as I came in. Single payer healthcare initiative. If so, how will you explain to your constituents 
that by admission of the initiative's writer, it will be the largest tax increase in Washington state history, especially with C Clallam County having an unemployment rate double of the state average. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in health care reform. Um, I'm not a real big fan of the initiative process as a way to do that. But um, if you look at the data on this, uh, both in California, where they're looking at this policy, and in Washington, there is a huge transition of cost. If you look right now at what you're paying for health care, whether it's through your employer or whether you're self-insured, uh, it's probably in the range of you know, ten dollars to $15,000 a year. You'll be able to cut those costs if there is a more unified, a more, uh, or a, a, a single payer, payer, payer type option. To get from this, where we are now to that is a very difficult transition. And my view is to look at how we do this incrementally and do that by expanding Medicaid, expanding Medicare, providing better services. But the big transition is that, that um, it, you will save probably, the cost right now are about 18, the cost of the taxes that you will be paying will actually be less than you're paying in healthcare premiums if you go to that, if you go, if you go to that system. But that transition is very difficult because a high number of folks in this state have their own, uh, the employer, Boeing, Amazon, Microsoft, pays for their health care. So to get those folks onto a single payer or uh, universal health care is a very difficult transition. And quite frankly, uh, I don't think the initiative process can do that, but it's something that I think we should work towards because there's a lot of advantages. You can negotiate lower pharmaceutical costs. You can move dollars upstream to provide more prevention and better health care uh, results. And so I think it's something we need to work on. I don't think the initiative process, 1600, is probably uh, the right way to make that transition. Well, it's, it's a simple fact that uh, the, state of Verm the state of Vermont, I can say this, and uh, California, the legislature in California have looked at a single payer uh, health care system and both have retreated from that because of the, of the cost of it. It's just simply unaffordable. Uh, I think a far better policy avenue to go down is to try to find ways to get market forces, consumer behavior, more information, more price trans transparency uh, put into the health care system. It's very difficult to know when you go into the hospital for a pr procedure or to, the, to, the, to your doctor's office for a procedure exactly what that's going to cost. In particular, hospitals have um, a very um, opaque pricing system. So uh, consumer behavior works every place else. I don't know really why it can't work in the healthcare economy. Uh, it seems to me that, um, that choice and transparency have a place there. We need, to, we need to explore avenues that get us there. On Medicaid, I think it's called Apple Health in the state, um, the real difficulty is it's not funded uh, nearly as well as it should be. The reimbursement rates for um, the hospital in Port Angeles, OMC, and the hospital in Grace Harbor County um, are pennies on the dollar, a, a small fraction of what the cost actually is. Uh, Jefferson Healthcare, Forks Community Hospital are reimbursed fully for the cost of a patient on Medicaid, not so for the others. So what that does, what that means is they have to transfer, those hospitals have to transfer the cost on either to the taxpayers or to the private pay insurance uh, population in that hospital. It drives up the cost for all the other people. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Dave Woodruff. I'm a dad, a granddad. I've lived long enough. I'll be a great granddad. Um, you're sitting in the county where the McClary decision emanated. 
So I'm a retired school superintendent, and I started teaching 60 years ago. And this state was rated as one of the highest states in the nation at that time. We have dropped over time to a very low position in my estimation. The courts have spoken, the Supreme Court has spoken, the Supreme Court has spoken, and the legislature has reacted. How do you see that reaction working practically going forward as the needs for a good education, a better education system presents itself? Thank you. It's, a, it's the constitutional duty and obligation of the legislature to step up and fund amply K through 12 basic education. Um, the, the legislature has, uh, has complied with that. The Supreme Court of the state has, uh, has certified that compliance. Uh, so now no backsliding. The legislature really needs to focus on not allowing that situation to, to decay as it did once before back in the 70s, I understand. The next challenge for the legislature, I believe, is school construction funding. It's not simply the, the constitutional duty of the legislature to fund teachers and textbooks, uh, quote unquote. It's, it's the obligation of the legislature to fund the schoolhouse that the students go into. There's, there have been many unfunded mandates that have come to local school districts with all day kindergarten, um, class size reduction for uh, grades one through three, and so on and so forth. So schoolhouse funding is, is as important, I believe, personally, as uh, adequate teaching, adequate uh, texts, adequate lab space, and so on and so forth. The, the top four obligations of the legislature before the legislature funds anything else are K through 12, the uh, service and the principal on state debt, the pension obligations that have been taken on by the state for all of the various retired uh, state and local employees, and funds that go by constitutional formula into the rainy day fund. Everything else uh, comes next. So the, the policy fight, the priority fight, is about everything other than those four spending items, in my view. And so um, no backsliding and focus on school construction. Well, I think this is an example of uh, my opponent just not being up to speed on what happens in the state constitution, quite frankly. Uh, but to your question on the operating side, which is the paramount duty, the legislature, since I've been there, has put over the last three terms, has put over $8 billion into K-12 education. And we have met the court's obligation under the McCleary case. But we have more work to do. We, in doing that, we have focused on what basic, how basic education is def defined. But there's a lot of special education needs. There's a lot of counseling needs. There's a lot of um, uh, just what's happening in our schoolhouses that impact our, the students' ability to learn are also things that the legislature needs to address. We are good as far as funding per student, per school district through the next year based on the money we've put in. But I think we're going to have to look at one of the ways we did that, and one of the reasons the court case was so challenging, is they wanted parity, equity, across the 295 school districts. And there were some school districts, Everett, for example, that had 55% of their funding was by local levies. Squim, it's about 4%. In Port Angeles, it's around 25, 30%. So how were we to level that out and provide that equity so what we had to do was try to limit those local levies. In doing that, for the next two years, with the money we've put in, schools are made whole. But moving forward, the legislature is going to have to look at some other funding, some other ways to, to provide those other services that are so fundamental. The construction piece, the Constitution is very clear. Our framers said that the operating of the schools is the state's obligation. The construction of the schools 
our local bonds and the local communities. My name is Sonny Flores, and I have two questions. I'm retired public safety, also I was in the military, finished my term. But I'm now as I get closer to Social Security age, the Social Security office tells me that I can't draw all my Social Security. It's considered double dipping, but I understand that elected positions can draw their full pension as well as their Social Security, but I can't. They did say that because I was in the military, I get a little bigger percentage. That's the first question about anybody ever dealing with that. The second one about, we hear about talk about complaining about Social Security going bankrupt. But people who make 250000 or more do not pay into Social Security. Now, if I'm wrong, let me know. But I've heard the phrase, scrap the cap. I've written my senator. I've written Kilmer. No one will respond. I just wrote Kilmer again over a year. And he sent a response saying, you know, we're going to respond, but that's it. But nobody wants to deal with this. I never hear it spoken to. Um, I should have entitlement to all my Social Security if I paid into it. But elected, if the president and his office can draw their full pension plus Social Security, I should be able to do the same, but in the 80s that changed, what I'm finding out. But, my, but the other question is, why isn't anybody wanting to deal with, when I write my senators and my representatives, no one will talk about scrap the cap, or people that are making $250,000 or more, they do not pay into Social Security. That's, I, I don't know if someone would do something about that. Um, yes, that's a federal issue. We don't deal with that in Olympia. Um, so, but we have actually looked at um, so, as capital budget chair, I look at the state's bonding um, status, how we, how the bonding houses look at our rating for borrowing money. And we have a AAA rating, and one of the reasons we have a AAA rating is because we have a fully funded pension system. We do not have an overexposure in our liability for pensions. And this is actually Helen Summers, who was just this tiny little diminutive woman who chaired the Appropriations Committee back about 15, 18 years ago, was a fire plug and drove a very substantial policy around pensions. And so the state is, Washington State is in the top three or top four states in the country as far as our exposure on pensions, and that makes it easier, that makes our bond rating higher. It is interesting though, the one, one of the things that impacts our bond rating is our very robust initiative process. Guys that are loaning us money, the bond guys, the bond market looks at the volatility that happens when all those initiatives, those IMAN initiatives were happening a few, you know, the last decade. They said, you know, that's, that increases your risk. So that ends up costing us more when we borrow our money. Luckily, Iman has not been very successful over the last few times, and so that's having less of an impact. But on this issue around long-term care and long-term care insurance, a lot of folks know that um, Medicare does not pay for long-term care. So we initiated this year and heard a bill that got through the House uh, on setting up our own uh, kind of social security that would deal with long-term care. I agree that's a that's a federal issue. Um, social security I'm talking about. Um, and it's good to know that uh, that we are fairly fully funded. I know when I was a county commissioner we'd get a bill from the um, the uh, Olympia folks that uh, were investing money and overseeing the pension funds we get a bill every once in a while for half a million dollars because the investment returns that had been expected had not materialized. So um, it, it, it depended on you, the local taxpayer, to fund, uh, in addition to what was already being funded, the, um, the costs of the pensions for the local employees that are, had retired using state, state funds. So it, it, that's a difficult issue. It's a federal issue as far as the cap on earned income uh, that's subject to Social Security taxes. And, and Olympia, the, the state government, really doesn't have much to do with that. Uh, as, as far as the, the cap goes? Uh, may I ask, sir, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, if you're age 66, 
you can go ahead and draw Social Security that you're entitled to without having to pay um, a penalty uh, that you have to if you, if you start drawing Social Security at age 62. So. Oh, uh, Sonny, I think we probably spent enough time on federal issues. For, yeah. And I, we, we, we feel your pain. We all feel your pain, but yes. I don't think that's something we're going to get an answer for here. Thanks. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you for coming to Port Townsend tonight to talk with us. My name is Ruth Gordon. I'm a Port Townsend voter, and I have the honor to serve Superior Court as its clerk. Uh, my question tonight concerns your understanding of the mental health care crisis as it exists in our state. I'd like you, to, your observations on the news that's just come out regarding Western State. And uh, I'd just like to tell you that the cost of competency evaluations in our criminal courts are rising. It's not just high, it's, it's going up. Uh, most of the people in our jail have mental health issues, and it would be splendid if there was some place for them to be other than jail. Um, so I'd like to, to understand what your understanding of this crisis is and anything that you might be able to do to assist in ameliorating that in the role of, le of legislative representative. Thank you. Ruth, nice to see you again, and you're absolutely right. Uh, we have a crisis in our institutional mental health care and our, our competency evaluations it takes far too long there's a, a certain time frame I can't remember what it is but it's pretty short between the time that somebody's incarcerated pending trial or hearing um, and they have to be determined competent or not and uh, that's done out of Western State uh, currently as I understand it I think there there is you know that mental health writ large is a, is a big issue and a hot button issue for the legislature next term. I think, you know, K through 12, like I said, no backsliding, but that's the next big thing that we've got to get a handle on from the state. The legislature can fund Western State, but it can't necessarily fix Western State. That's a function of the executive branch, of the governor. So the legislature can, can do certain things, but it can't do everything. The, the governor and the executive branch are going to have to step up and fix that terrible situation at Western State. Um, it just got worse, as we all know, because the, the federal certification was lost, and that was, I can't remember the exact fraction, but it was a pretty big chunk of their budget just evaporated. So the other piece to this is that when the, the large state institutions were done away with decades ago, the money did not follow the patients that were formally um, institutionalized. A lot of them wound up on the street. Um, the governor, I think, has, has had a, what I think is a pretty good idea to try to establish smaller mental health facilities, I don't know if you'd call them hospitals or what, 16 bed facilities, a lot of them uh, regionally around the state. I think that has some promise. We really need to look hard at that. I found it kind of curious that of the four issues that my opponent wanted to fund, mental health wasn't one of them. Um, but it's a huge issue. And the loss of 53 million, which is what we're losing from the Center for Medical Services for Western State, will be a challenge, but it's a challenge we just have to meet. I mentioned in my opening remarks that I'm on the Health Care Committee and I'm also on the Capital Budget Committee. It's actually the first time in a long time, or maybe ever, that we've had a dialogue with our capital investments and our operating investments around mental health. So we were able to put, um, and I'll just look at my notes here, 65 million towards community behavioral health. So that we address this issue in the communities and make people healthy in their communities and not have to get them into Western. And the issue is around forensic, right? So it's a criminal evaluation to see whether you're mentally capable to stand trial. 
One of the problems we have is we have a number of the wings, and I've toured Western Hospital three times. We have three wings there that are with older patients that quite frankly have dementia and Alzheimer's. And what we're trying to do is build, and that's what we did, that's this kind of crosswalk between the operating budget and the capital budget, is to build facilities in the community so those people can get out of the hospital and get back into their community where they can get the appropriate care. Western is not the place for that kind of care. But we put um, you know, 58 million into renovation for Western, and we put 24 million into the support of housing for folks to get services in the, ho in the housing where they live. So we're starting to address this, and it will be a major issue for us in this coming legislative session to continue this work of addressing this issue as much as we can in the community. And I think the link between the healthcare committee and the capital budget committee is a good place to be for that. So we have time for one more question before intermission and cookies. So you don't want to make it too long. All right, thanks, Rick. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Bruce Cowan, and I began teaching here 40 years ago. So Dave's got a little longer record, but I worked with the children of Jefferson County. Yes, you're right, 46 to 50 percent of local children uh, qualify for free and reduced lunch. That means their families qualify. That means they make about, for a three-person family, about $30,000 a year. That means that they can afford a rent of $759 a month. That means they probably qualify for housing vouchers, but they do not have housing available to them. We have not uh, built subsidized housing, new subsidized housing in this county for over 10 years. These are folks who do the work around here for all us retired people. Uh, the, these folks live in substandard housing or they pay too much, 50%. They live in squats. 100 children are homeless in Jefferson County. The market is not interested in helping them. The state housing trust fund hasn't created housing, as I say. Um, we know that uh, uh, it's going to take a lot of new units. How can we help our community? How can you help our community meet this need, which is our, one of our primary needs? And housing is the issue uh, not, a, not just in central Puget Sound, but across the state. Uh, we were, Mike and I, my Representative Chapman and I were out in Forks last December, and there were two teachers out there that were commuting from Port Angeles because they couldn't find housing in Forks. Jefferson Healthcare has signed contracts with nurses who have then had to cancel the contracts because the nurses couldn't find housing here in Port Townsend or in East Jefferson County. So not only is it homelessness has a housing challenge, but workforce housing, affordable housing for the workforce is a big challenge. As capital budget chair, we worked in a very bipartisan way to put about $120 million into the housing trust fund. The housing trust fund makes a lot of investments in, in housing, particularly for the folks in the lowest 25% of the income stream. But the advantage of that is they take those dollars and use tax market credits to multiply that by about five. So every dollar we put in in the trust, we get about 500, we get another four or five dollars back. So that's addressing that part of the spectrum. When I've talked, and this has been an issue as I've you know, been around the district and around the state because as a capital budget chair, they come to me for housing dollars. Um, the big challenge right now is the cost of materials. Um, and the shortage of labor. And so there's just not people to build, and the materials are very, very expensive. I don't think the trade war that's going on in D.C. is going to help. I've already heard that prices for materials for steel studying is going up 5% a week. So that's one of the issues. Looking at some land use is one of the issues, and incentivizing, if we can, more uh, multiple housing duplexes, fourplexes, and sixplexes. But it's a very complex issue that will take a number of uh, strategies to alleviate. The housing trust fund money is only uh, one part of the equation. Uh, um, 
I think the legislature really needs to, uh, in conjunction with the building industry and the realty industry and local governments, because local governments uh, control under our system of laws land use planning, is to look at the, the entire range of why housing isn't being built. In simple terms, the solution to housing that's too pricey is to build more of it. It's a supply and demand simple uh, process. So I think we need to look at exactly what it is or the things that, that contribute to the high base cost of housing and see if those things are really necessary or they can be temporarily relaxed if they are necessary uh, to, to make it uh, more possible for the private market to respond to the obvious signal that's being sent right now. Our, real, our rental rates in Clallam County, and I'm sure here in Jefferson County, are, are extremely tight. I've heard it's about 1% vacancy, uh, which is nothing uh, in Clallam County. It's probably about the same here, I would guess. I haven't heard those statistics. But it's a private market issue primarily. Housing um, for uh, workers, workforce uh, families, working families, are principally market-based. Uh, we need to look at the Growth Management Act and see if there are some things there that can be relaxed and, and rural counties and rural cities be given some additional flexibility in land use and land use planning. Um, and certainly, as, uh, as I said before, the Housing Trust Fund is an is a answer to the, a piece of the puzzle for those that are disabled or unable to work for some reason or what have you. My time's up. Thank you. All right, thank you for your questions. We're going to go to closing arguments. And uh, since Mr. Theringer started first uh, at opening, Mr. McIntyre will start first with closing. Thank you. Uh, the legislature has a lot of challenges uh, facing it. And it requires the, the best in terms of uh, background and preparation for making the critical policy decisions and the critical funding decisions that the legislature always uh, has responsibility for. Uh, you've heard uh, some uh, of my perspective about what comes first in terms of the annual budget or the biennial budget. Um, this biennium, uh, the revenues have come in, uh, in about 16% above what was originally expected. Next biennium, the economy is still expected to perform well enough where revenues uh, are going to grow about 9% over this biennium. So it seems like to me we don't have a, a revenue problem. We have an issue about spending priorities. What are the most important things, the most critical things that need to be dealt with by the legislature? Uh, you've heard the, the, the top four, mental health is, uh, is uh, right next in terms of the rest of the funding priorities. Um, you need somebody with experience in local government. We both have that, but, but we need somebody there that represents the rural values that we enjoy and appreciate here in our three county legislative district. This is different than urban Washington. We need to acknowledge that. Uh, we need to actually celebrate that. Uh, a lot of us came here because of that. Uh, I know that's the case for my wife and myself. So I am uh, ready, willing, and able, and prepared to be your representative in Olympia. And I certainly uh, appreciate your being here, the good questions that were asked this evening. And I ask again for your vote. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming again. Thank the League and the Association of University of Women for putting this on. I think experience does make a difference. And in the eight years that I've been in the legislature, I've been able to build the relationships with certainly the members of my caucus, members on the other side of the aisle in the House, and, and the other chamber on the other side of the rotunda. And as a capital budget chair, and on the appropriations committee, and as on the health care committee, I think you've heard a little bit of how that experience helps provide solutions to the problems we face here on the Olympic Peninsula. This session 
with a Democratic majority in the Senate for the first time since I've been in the legislature, we were able to fully fund education and, and solve the McCleary problem. While cutting your taxes, we cut your property taxes by 30 cents per thousand. When the, we were still in session a year ago and the Republican Senate wanted to charge you $2.85 per thousand. We were not interested in that. The Democratic caucus was not interested in that. We finally got them down to 82 cents. And then this year, because the economy is doing well, and by closing some tax preferences, we were able to give you a 30 cent tax break. We want to continue to do that work. We're building a couple dental clinics, one in Port Angeles, one here. We're expanding workforce training in, in the wood products industry, and I mentioned the healthcare industry. We're investing in parks and pools. Money's going into Fort Warden and Fort Flagler for some of their infrastructure needs. We're improving the access to health care by strengthening the reimbursement rates for Olympic Medical Center and Jefferson Health and for Grace Harbor Hospital. We provided equal pay for women. We had more affordable child care. We have reproductive parity, banning bump stocks, which we talked about earlier, preventing domestic violence abusers from buying guns, and, and simplifying voter registration. And we did that and got out of, ta out of town in 60 days. So I think that's a good record to run on, F fully funding education and giving you a tax break, plus meeting a lot of the other needs. Experience matters. I would urge and I would appreciate your vote in the primary of August 7th. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yes, and I want to applaud both of you for uh, coming and, and talking to our community thank and you. running for office. I think you have a future, Rick. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take a five-minute break, and uh, these two organizations have paid for the room, so they need some help. If you can make some donations, we can cover the cost of the room and, uh, and enjoy the cookies.